We're focused on emotional eating now, sometimes referred to as stress eating. Uh, many of us can relate to this, and it's all because of our relationship with food. And so as we go through this afternoon, um, we're briefly going to talk about stress as if we don't already know what it is, but there are different types of it, and it's important for us to be aware of the different types and how this does tend to affect our behaviors, um, including eating. We're also going to spend some time talking about how we're able to determine if this is actually a problem. And I don't like that word for me, that's like a bad word, um, but an issue that is kind of impeding upon our quality of life or that's causing us some element of harm whenever it comes to our health. And so we'll be focusing on that. And then the last section of this, it really does come down to changing our relationship with food. Um, and that is a tough thing to do. It's like breaking up, okay? It's a, you know, no one likes to do these types of things. But it really does take forming a healthier relationship with the types of foods that we're putting in our body to really help to improve our physical health as well as our emotional health. And so, with that being said, um, stress can be defined as how our body and brain respond to any demand. Okay, so this is a dual relationship between the two, our body and our brain and how they respond to any single demand that's placed on us throughout the day, whether that even be a thought or a task that's given to us by somebody else, um, something that we need to do, or our body's own physiological needs. That also serves as a demand. All of this can be considered a stressor <clears throat> because it's causing some type of disruption or awareness within our body system. Stress can either be short-term or long-term. Um, long-term or reoccurring, reoccurring stress presents as the greatest risk to our health and changes our quality of life and challenges our quality of life substantially. What happens with this is that our body is constantly being put under pressure and it's not designed that way. So before we kind of jump into what it all does in terms of our operating system, just from a kind of like a design perspective, our body is just designed to experience stress in short bursts, okay? So even from like an evolutionary kind of context, our body was just supposed to be under stress whenever it was facing some type of risk of harm. Like we were getting ready to get like eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or a bear was chasing us in the woods or there we saw a snake. Those types of events, you know, a storm coming, uh, whatever, was supposed to serve as that amount of stress, okay? An actual fear, an actual kind of threat to our lives, to our safety, um, minimally to our understanding maybe of things at that point in time. As we have evolved, we have developed maybe, unfortunately, this new ability within our brains to worry and to become stressed about things that haven't necessarily happened. So no longer are we under um, short-term stress just from something happening that moment. A lot of our long-term or chronic stress comes from the way in which we're thinking about situations that maybe haven't even occurred. And that even those thoughts put our body in that same raised physiological state and cause harm to it, okay? So whenever we're looking at long-term stress, the body um, gets no clear signal to the return to normal functioning, all right? So if I just got chased by a bear, I know that once the bear's not there, I'm going to be able to calm back down, right? <laughs> Eventually, I may feel exhausted, I may take a nap, but I'm going to have a sense of relief. Whenever we have a long-term or a chronic stressor in our life, that return to normal doesn't normally happen because we just kind of keep poking the bear in that sense through focusing on those thoughts, focusing on that stressor. So our body doesn't necessarily have that opportunity to kind of return to that normal level of functioning. And as a result, it has very detrimental effects on our heart um, as well as other systems within our body. So we always talk about heart disease first whenever it comes to stress because that's where we can feel it a lot of times the most, right? Um, we know that this is the case whenever it comes to things like high blood pressure. You know, a lot of folks, whenever they come into our office, um, if they have been subjected through a very stressful situation or if they're living with a long-term chronic stressor, their blood pressure is always higher, 
and oftentimes may even take a medical intervention to kind of help out in addition to what we're trying to work on too. Diabetes. If you're exposed to stress and you have either type 1 or type 2 diabetes, it's going to cause your blood sugar to go up. And that's going to present challenges when it comes to your own management of your condition with that. Again, high blood pressure. Sleep problems. Oftentimes, and as we've talked about within these uh, lunch and learns as well, um, <clears throat> we schedule worry time for night time, right? So sometimes people do really good throughout the day, and then as soon as they go to lay down and rest at night, that's whenever all of the shoulda, woulda, couldas, worries, all these other thoughts, all these other stressors that maybe you encounter today or that you're concerned about happening tomorrow tend to kind of come into play. For other folks, they tend to be able to fall asleep pretty good, but then they wake up in the middle of the night and they're all of a sudden confronted with this big kind of sense of worry, almost panic about whatever that stressor is that they kind of took to bed with them, right? And so we often see a whole lot of sleep problems whenever somebody has been subjected to chronic stress. This also affects your heart. And so we have to be aware of the kind of compiling effect that this has on folks as well. It weakens your immune system, um, causes GI problems. This is something that is a huge focus, especially within even our GI department, is that if you have a chronic medical condition like IBS, oftentimes um, there is some type of long-term chronic stressor that is serving to exacerbate that condition. And that really has a very detrimental effect on your health and the types of activities that you're trying to partake in. And so stress management really becomes a key factor whenever we're looking at um, GI problems in particular. And changes in libido. So our sex drive actually changes substantially um, based upon our stress level. This in and of itself can cause problems within ourselves in terms of maybe self-esteem or connections with our partner and can even cause other relationship um, kind of changes as well, which again, come back to being stressful as well, right? So in terms of the effects on the body, this is all what we know as being hardcore science that chronic long-term stressors can do to us. And so it's always important that we bring awareness to that first when talking about stress. Now, there are good stress and kind of bad stress. Again, I don't necessarily like those two words because they're kind of evaluative or judgmental, but whenever we're talking about good stress, good stress can be motivating. Right? It can make us maybe want to do things, maybe make us want to achieve um, something greater. It can help us to promote behaviors that are going to move within that kind of value direction. It can be life-saving. All right? And so it's in those moments um, that our body's natural design kicks into gear. So if we are being chased by the bear right in that moment, then that good stress can help us to move into a safer situation. We can help somebody else. Okay because um, of that type of response. Um, stress can also be good in terms that it can be loving, right? Whenever we are really in love or we have a really um, pleasurable evening with our partner or spouse, our heart starts beating, you know, we have a more excited physiological response to it. That's a good type of stress too. And then excitement. There's really not too much of a difference between fear and excitement. And I tell my patients this all the time because that's something that we confront a whole lot whenever it comes to like anxiety. Um, from a physiological kind of response, the body is the same, whether you're scared to death or whether you're excited as can be. So again, if you're about ready to get eaten by a bear or if you've just won the Powerball, your body's gonna respond the same, okay? Situationally, things are different, but also the way in which you're thinking about the situation is different, okay? But your body's going to respond the same, and so that's a kind of something to, to consider whenever we're undergoing these different types of stress. Now, how do you know if it's bad? Listen to the words that you use to describe your day, your situation, or how you're feeling. If you say that the day or that whatever it was that you were doing that day was draining, <laughs> that's not a good type of stress. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Um, if it was consuming, if it took all of your time, right? Uh, if it was just worry-filled, that you've just been so anxious or you've just been so focused or restless about it, if it's been <coughs> depressing, 
if the situation, the relationship, um, whatever it is that you're going through has been depressing, that's not going to be a good type of stress. If it's constant, if you're looking back at your days or your experience and saying, when will this ever end? You know, I'm so tired of having to continue to deal with this. Listen to those words. That gives you a really good picture um, of what you're going through and the fact that you're experiencing a chronic stressor that is really going to need to be addressed in order to help improve your health. If you feel that it's trapping, like it's never going to end, or that you're always going to be stuck within that situation, again, another indicator of, um, of bad stress. Another word that sometimes gets used, and this happens a lot whenever somebody's describing what they think is like their energy level, is exhausted. Okay? If you use the word exhausted, that's due to an emotion. If you say the word tired, it's because you've just worked outside all day in the field. You know what I mean? You've been running around after kids all day. If you've been using the word exhausted, though, that's due to some type of stressor or emotion that is just, again, draining so much out of you. Tiredness is fine. Tiredness is good, right? Exhausted, not so much. So again, whenever we're looking at stress, it's important for us to recognize um, how it does affect our health and could lead towards chronic medical conditions or making them worse, as well as there's differences between good stress and bad stress. Where does it come from? Where doesn't it, right? I mean, that's the number one is always going to be other people, um, but it can also come from other things too. So work right changes in work um, changes in schedules one of the things that I see a whole lot within the uh, folks that I work with is whenever people retire we think that that's going to be a wonderful lovely time and it is for about six months <laughs> and then not so much thereafter um, and that's just due to this change that kind of results from this the, the schedule change the work that really does play a big part in our life that's not there family again Number one, uh, friends, other types of relationships that you may have with acquaintances, people that you run into, um, folks from church, the daily grind, cars, that's no fun either. Anytime something goes wrong with the car, that's like already the mark for like a bad day, right? Uh, transportation, financial issues. I mean, if you're all the time, again, focused on the lack of money, how am I going to afford medications, how am I going to do this, that, and the other, that's a chronic long-term stressor that can really, again, affect your body. Uh, different traumas that can happen, you know, being in a car accident, um, being uh, a victim of some type of crime, witnessing um, an act, hearing about something that was uh, a life or death experience with a loved one, that too can be traumatic and cause these different types of things to happen. Uh, community and world events. I mean, we're living in a world now where we have access to everything that's happening all the time and everywhere. If we pay too much attention to that, it's not going to be good. I mean, that's just a piece. I, know I don't watch TV, I don't read the newspaper, and I don't watch the news. And you may not think I'm very worldly, but I just don't pay attention to negativity. Okay? Um, I'm very selective in what I bring into my world. Uh, and so much of that right now is just not very happy, pleasant stuff. Medical conditions. Any time that you've been diagnosed with one medical condition, any additional medical condition, medication, or treatment that then occurs from that is going to be an additional compiling stressor that does just make it kind of harder to deal with the day-to-day -day types of things. All right. So how does all this kind of relate to eating? Eating is what we turn to a lot of times for coping, right? Um, because it's easy, it's acceptable, um, and it's accessible. So we have it almost everywhere. Um, I got some funny little memes as part of this. Uh, why can't I be uh, an emotional exerciser instead of an emotional eater? Now I would argue that neither are good, right? <laughs> um, but for the purposes of this right now, what we know is that so much of us turn to food as a source of comfort, right or that we see it as a reward right or punishment and so just to kind of go through these examples typical comfort foods are what candy and 
Happy food. Okay, what's a happy? Uh, heavy food. Heavy food. Okay. Food. Like what? What would be a pizza? Pizza. Soups and stews and, you know, heavy chicken and dumplings. Chicken and dumplings. <laughs> right. Things that they grew up with that mommy made them feel better with, right? Somebody said sugar. Who was that? Like the desserts, right? Cream corn. Cream corn. <laughs> totally. Okay. What else, huh? Did you guys say something back there too? Pies, right? Um, what? Chocolate. 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 Ice cream. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, we could go down a whole laundry list and we're all going to get even hungrier even though we might have just had it, you know, some nice food here as part of the lunch and learn. But that's the case. And so oftentimes whenever we're feeling some type of uh, increased stress, we turn to food, right? Then we have this idea that food can be um, punishment or reward. So a reward, again, maybe faulty thinking here would be, well, I've been really good, so I deserve this cupcake, right? How often do we say that? How often do we do that to kids? Yeah. Like you've been good. If you do this to my four-year-old, we're going to have a nice long talk, okay? So if you say, oh, you've been so good here, I'm going to give you a piece of candy or a cupcake. No, you're going to watch her for the next four hours from that sugar, right? But that's where that comes into play. A food should not be used as a reward, all right? It shouldn't be used as punishment either. So if I've been bad, I have to eat broccoli. If I've been bad, I have to eat a salad, you know, for lunch or something like that, especially if we're trying to manage our weight. These are the types of ideas that we get into, is that we develop this really unhealthy relationship with food and how it's supposed to be used. And so in trying to kind of reframe this, what we want to maybe think about is its real purpose, okay? Food at its core and at its basis is supposed to be uh, nutritious because it's supposed to serve as energy to help to fuel this vehicle, all right? So even from like a cultural or, you know, kind of a spiritual complex, if this is our vessel, this is our vehicle, we want to be sure that the things that we're putting into it are of high quality, are nutritious, and are going to help it to run efficiently. Unfortunately, sometimes what we've learned through life, experiences, whatever else, is that the food that we're putting into this is not good fuel. It's not helping our bodies run, and it's not helping us to cope with the different situations that we're in. And unfortunately, then that becomes reinforcing, right? So then every time we get upset or every time that we're having a problem, we go back to that instead of doing some other type of alternative, and it just continues to set us up. So, with that being said, this is also a really popular uh, little meme. Uh, food is the most abused anxiety drug. Exercise is the most underutilized antidepressant. That is a hundred percent fact. Okay, uh, just this past week, I was uh, presenting at a different type of event with a psychiatrist here in Huntington. Um, to a group of scholars at Marshall and I don't believe that any of them thought that a psychiatrist and a psychologist would be talking to them about food <laughs> but we were and that's because of the role that it plays in our emotions all right so these were like college students or whatever else and their diet mainly consists of caffeine and carbs right <laughs> so they're going to Starbucks and getting a big old frappuccino and then I don't know a brownie that's kind of setting them up. You know, we're jacking ourselves up pretty high there for a bit, and then what happens? Crash. And then we keep on that cycle. The problem with that, and even if we do that in our real life, so maybe we have a cup of coffee for breakfast, and then we're also having, I don't know, some <clears throat> oatmeal and then some with some sugar on top of it or some brown sugar and things like that. We're pumping ourselves up just kind of full of sugar, which is causing us really to have a lot of brain fog. We're not able to concentrate as well. We might have a slight boost in energy, but then we feel really just kind of fatigued and sluggish, right? And then we're challenged with the day. And then all of these stressors that we feel like we can't keep up with for whatever reason, but it may not be due necessarily to our abilities. It's due to what we're putting in our body. So by making some basic modifications to that, we're actually able to think clearer, to learn better, and to reduce the experience of anxiety. 
because anxiety a lot of times is based upon how you're feeling physically. Like that's the first cue is that maybe your heart rate changes or that your breathing might change or things like that from a physiological standpoint. Well, that can be induced by the types of foods that you're putting into your body, especially if they're stimulant, sugar, kind of carb-based types of things. So really being mindful of that and how it kind of plays into things. <coughs> exercise. Exercise helps to release endorphins, those feel-good neuro, uh, neurochemicals within our brain, the natural kind of antidepressants that we have. Anytime that we are moving, our body feels good because it was meant to move. Okay? It was not designed to be um, sedentary um, by nature. We were not designed to stay in boxes as humans. We were designed to kind of be outside, to have some fresh air, to see the sunshine, especially now that the four months of gray season are over, right? Hopefully. Um, but that's the kind of purpose with this. And so that's really what we want to try to get back to, um, is how we can change our relationship with food, use it more efficiently, as well as activity to kind of help us to cope with these things. So what's the relationship between stress and food? Um, why do we use it? Okay. It's avoidance, right? If I'm sitting here eating, then I don't have to deal with whatever else is going on. Plus, then if I like to cook, I can use that as an excuse too, right? So I can sit here and bake all of this really nice sweet stuff because A, I know other people are going to enjoy it, right? But I'm also going to really enjoy avoiding doing whatever the stressful activity is or whatever is causing us a lot of worry and anxiety. I'm going to focus on cooking this, then I'm going to focus on eating it, <laughs> right? And then say it's for everybody else too, okay? It's a beautiful avoidance strategy. It's filling, right? We um, in this culture have kind of adopted the idea that we're supposed to feel full with our meals, okay? Um, are you full? That's even what we ask kids, like are you full? The feeling of fullness though is not necessarily what we want to have um, even from like a GI kind of perspective because um, <clears throat> there's a missed signal that goes between our brain and our gut and oftentimes whenever we feel the sensation of full we're already over full because then we're going to start to feel the rest of the food that we've kind of you know consumed actually hit our stomach later on and then we're going to hit that like Thanksgiving you know kind of stomach and just kind of feel not real great the rest of the day. What we want to think about instead is feeling satisfied. Are you satisfied? You know, if we think about maybe our stomach and our eating instead of that we're trying to fill the tank to 100%, just go in with 80, okay? 80%, that's going to help us. That's going to be the maximum um, level of efficiency in order to kind of help us to run. Again, it's kind of a learned behavior. You know, what are comfort foods? What do we turn to whenever we're stressed? Because in our minds, we have kind of adapted this idea that that's what makes us feel better, is to eat this. But then once we eat this, generally speaking, unless you're eating something like magic, the problem or the situation is still there. And I haven't found a magic food or anything that makes the situation go away just yet. But that's the thought that we kind of get in our head, all right? that it's going to make it better, or may make it better temporarily. Um, but again, the long-term effects of this become more of a challenge. It's stereotypical, right, um, for us to eat certain foods, okay? So uh, women a lot of times get the bad rap for eating like a gallon of ice cream or turn into chocolate whenever we get upset, okay? Um, guys sometimes will get a bunch of like, I don't know, chicken wings or pizza as we kind of talked to her, you know, a bunch of those uh, like sandwiches types of things, chips, all of that kind of stuff to be fulfilling with them. Again, there's very stereotypical things that we eat whenever we get stressed. Some people don't eat at all when they get stressed. And that sets them up for their own cycle um, of distress, of unhealthy kind of effects from it as well. Food's accessible. We can get it anywhere and it's just fine. No one will look down on you most of the time for eating anything, right? Okay? This doesn't have the same type of stigma uh, around it either. So it's, access I mean, it's acceptable. Okay? It's expected at times for us to eat or for even for us to bring food to people. Um, for example, in this culture, if somebody has a baby, what do we do? Bring them food, 
right? We're making meals for like the next few weeks. If somebody dies, what do we do? Bring them food. Somebody's sick, what do we do? For nearly every life event, we bring people food, which is fine. But again, it comes down to the fact that we're also attaching that food with that stressful life event instead of perhaps doing something different in, in conjunction with that as well. All right. So you see how that just kind of sets us up? I mean, we're not doing ourselves any favors here, right? All right. So when does this become a problem? If you find um, yourself turning to food for comfort, either consciously or unconsciously when faced with a difficult situation. Sometimes people don't recognize that they're eating or that they're even overeating. That happens a lot. You would think that we would be consciously aware that that's what we're doing, but oftentimes we're not. We just find ourselves almost in this habit of just kind of going into the kitchen, going into the cupboard, taking out the Fritos, and then eating a whole bag of them before we even know that they're gone, right? So. If you find yourself turning to it <coughs> for the purpose of comfort or that you find yourself in that moment just being like, oh my gosh, I've sat here and ate a whole sleeve of Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> That's a sign. That might be a sign that we need to kind of be very mindful of these things. When the habit interferes with weight loss or other health-based goals slash doctor's recommendations, all right? Um, again, we see this a whole lot in one area that I specialize in is diabetes. And um, the typical comfort foods that we're eating at that point in time are also high in carbs. And that presents as a great challenge to uh, diabetic patients. And so if the type of foods that they're eating at these points of times when stress are causing negative effects on their blood sugar, making the cost of their medications having to go up, their level of care having to increase, um, problems with neuropathy or other types of things. We've really got to be focused on that in order to kind of come up with alternative ways to kind of cope with that instead of turning um, towards food in those times. Uh, when you feel guilty after consuming a meal or a snack, that might be a sign too. So if you've just you know, sat down and, and ate something, um, and you feel bad about it. That's kind of like the shopper's guilt, right, that people get whenever they buy something. You also get it whenever eating food, too. So if you have that experience, um, when it happens in binges, if you find that at certain points in times you just sit down and just you can't eat enough, and you just have to keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back for it, that can also be a sign as well. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, whenever it's being used as a reward or punishment. I mean, that's just setting us up for failure just in and of itself. And so we want to kind of think of it in those terms. And again, I don't like the, necessarily the words good or bad because I think they're judgment. What I want us to think of is what's going to be the most healthy, what's going to be the most nutritious thing that we can kind of do in terms of our food selection to help us out whenever it even comes to stress or just livelihood in general. So how can we cope with this stuff? Um, first thing is we want to just stop and ask ourselves basic questions. Lots of times, again, we are mindlessly eating whenever we're stressed. Now, we may have went to the cupboard or to the refrigerator with the intent on getting something to eat, but only eating a certain portion or a certain quantity. But if we find that that doesn't happen, <laughs> okay, that might be your sign. So ask yourself, <clears throat> are you hungry? Are you really hungry? Or are you trying to feed something else? Are you trying to feed some emotional kind of beast that's there? Are you trying to fill some type of void with that? Um, are you actually really thirsty? A lot of times we miscue that and we're actually thirsty. And so the first thing to do is actually get a drink of water. You know, get a drink of water. Stop and ask yourself, are you upset? Ask yourself that. You know, am I upset right now? Is something frustrating me? Is something worrying me? Is something bothering me? Identify what that stressor is, okay? That is the first step in kind of coping with it um, and finding other ways to work with it. Are you bored? Most people that I talk to about eating, they're eating because they're bored too. It's either because they're stressed or they're bored, 
<laughs> you know, sometimes they'll say that they like it, but no one likes to feel overly full all the time. And so that's very rarely what I get actually when it comes down to the root of it. It's because they're bored or because they have something emotional going on. So ask yourself that. You know, if you're just sitting down after you've had supper and you're watching your evening television and you find that that's the time in which you might binge or just overindulge on some things, you're probably bored with the television programs. You might think that you like them, but what you've actually done is form a habit of sitting there watching them. <laughs> okay? I mean, I it's amazing what happens whenever you do this. Play a, bit, play a game instead. I'm a huge fan of people bringing back board games. We play board games almost every night in our house. And I have a 15-year-old, and like I said, we have the little four-year-old. I mean, he's, he plays board games with us. He's a very cool, very fun kid. But that's just not something people typically do anymore these days, right? My husband and I, if no kids are there, we're going to sit there and play a board game instead of maybe watching television. More stimulating, conversations get going. You know, we're not sitting there eating a big old thing of popcorn while we're doing it. It's a fun activity to consider. So really look at that boredom question. See what's going on with you in that moment. Halt. This is um, a method that's actually used in addiction. And truthfully, food is the greatest addiction that our nation faces. We talk all the time, locally, nationally, about opioids. There is not a single drug that costs as much to our society as what food does in terms of health costs and negative effects on our lives, period. We don't think that way because it's legal, we think that it's safe or whatever else, but if we actually look at cost of health care and what they're attributed to, the number one thing that they're attributed to is not substances, it's the foods that we're putting into our body as being the number one cost for the reason why health care is so expensive and our health is so poor as a nation because of what we're putting into our body. And so this is where this idea of this HALT method kind of comes into play, is that we want to ask ourselves, are we hungry? <clears throat> are we angry? Are we lonely? Which kind of goes back to being bored. Or are we tired? Those are the times in which often we're most susceptible to doing something that oftentimes is counterintuitive to what we really need or want to be doing. And so we want to kind of just stop, and that's where that HALT kind of thing even comes into play. Even working with folks, I'll just say just physically almost put your hand out and just give yourself, pump the brakes and go through this type of self-assessment so that way you can make the healthiest decision for you. Uh, trigger awareness. This is key. If we find that we are in a state of chronic stress and that we are always turning to food in order to kind of help us to cope with it, we really need to identify what area this chronic stressor is coming from. And it can be all of them, but certainly being able to kind of narrow that down is going to be the most effective thing that we can do in order to help with our decisions that we're doing there. So is it people? Is it a certain person? Is it a certain situation that you find yourself in with maybe a group of people? You know, the number one thing that I work with with folks on is dealing with other people. They're everyone's number one stressor, right? And so what can we kind of do to maybe change the people um, who we're exposed to? Do we have to maybe end some toxic relationships or codependent relationships? Do we need to change the way in which we're responding to people, communication, um, all different types of things. So it's a really multi-layered kind of process. But if it's a certain group of people or a person, that's something we want to bring awareness to. That's going to serve as our red flag that's going to put us at risk. Um, our thoughts, you know, are we staying so focused maybe in the past or in the present that it's just creating this again buildup of uh, stress within our body um, and within our mind that is just kind of propelling us down that way. Our thoughts seem very hard to control, but I promise we can try to modify, we can try to, um, to change and challenge them so that way, again, it makes it more effective for us in what we're doing. Is it our feelings? Again, a lot of times we're emotional eaters. We eat when we're sad. We eat when we're happy. We eat whenever we're anxious. <laughs> we eat when we're depressed, or sometimes maybe we don't. Um, our feelings tend to dictate so much of what we do in terms of behaviors, right? But the problem, truthfully, with both thoughts and feelings is that neither one of them are facts. 
Hey, I can think all day I'm a big purple elephant. Am I going to turn into one? No. I can feel all day like a big purple elephant, certainly, right? But am I going to turn into one? No. The only thing that's a fact is what we do. It's our behaviors. But oftentimes we allow our thoughts and our feelings to direct our behaviors. And that's whenever we find ourselves kind of in a, in a little bit of a puddle. So we really want to bring awareness to that. Is it a certain event that we find ourselves in or experiencing that is serving as that stressor, that trigger that is kind of pushing us down this road? Being able to identify that is key, all right? Um, culprit. <clears throat> what we're talking about here is the actual food itself. Because whenever we're stressed out or whenever we're emotionally eating, we tend to go to certain things. Is it salty? We just love to eat salty things when we're stressed out, right? Okay, like what would be some examples of salties? Potato chips. Chips, potato <laughs> chips, right? Absolutely. Um, what else? Popcorn. Mm-hmm, popcorn. popcorn. Uh, we like things that are fatty. Right? So what are some fatty things that we turn to in stress or that we emotion? What did you say? Ice cream. Ice cream. Okay. What else? Cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers. <laughs> okay. Right? Some people really like fried food too. Like they just want to get a big old bucket of like fried chicken or something or um, pork rinds or whatever else. I mean, I have people tell me all bacon. I have some people that just eat, they cr munch on a bunch of bacon because it's salty, it's crunchy, and it's fatty. And that's what they'll sit there and just binge on is bunches of bacon. Um, carbs, right? What are some carbs that we just love to turn to? Potatoes. Potatoes. Any time. Uh, <laughs> right. Mashed, right? Pasta. Rolls at the steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those are addictive, right? Yeah. Well, you sure. Them in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Bread just kind of baking at times, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those are the culprits. But for each one of us, there's likely one that just is, that's ours. You know what I mean? Like, I may not be a big carb person, but if you give me something that's salty, okay. Now, even with this, there's some science behind this. And so, again, if we think back to our body being in a stressed out state, what it needs in order to kind of help it to recover a lot of times is a fat source, right? As well as an energy source. And so that's where the carbs come into play. And then the other two just make it more appetizing, right? <laughs> and being crunchy and salty. But if we even think about what those culprits are and go back to those chronic medical conditions that we mentioned before, if we are stressed out, emotionally eating things that are high in salt and we have high blood pressure, right? If we are eating things that are just have a really high maybe fat content and not incorporating some um, better sources of like fiber um, in with that, then we're talking about heart disease potentially there, right? Um, <clears throat> crunchy can go with any of those different types of categories. Carbs also goes with them all, all right? So we think about carbs a lot of times when it comes to diabetes, but diabetics are more at risk for heart disease. Um, and so we have to think of it in those contents. All of those things are often high in calories, which is enlisted up there. And if something's high in calories, that can contribute to uh, increases in weight, you know, weight gain, um, being considered obese. Um, and what we know happens with that is it terribly disrupts sleep. Okay. Most people who have sleep problems, we find if they lose five to 10 pounds, their sleep improves substantially. It's amazing, um, but it's the truth. And so we have to look at those different things and recognize that these culprits are what is contributing back to these chronic medical conditions that we may be facing or that we may be you know, actually helping to kind of get us on that path to, to occurring within our lives. So identify these things ask yourself those questions know what those triggers are know what your goal your go-to kind of culprit is to it whenever it comes to emotional eating with this okay how to cope item selection you can't eat what you don't have right there's this old movie from the 80s and um you, if you don't invite a vampire into your house it can't come in 
You know what I'm talking about? It's a silly thing, but if you don't bring it into your house, it can't come in. If you identify what your culprit is, if you identify what your go-to kind of emotional food drug is that you're eating whenever you're stressed out, you can prevent that already by not bringing it into your home, okay? It's, it works, I promise. <laughs> if it's not there, you can't eat it. <laughs> you could, or this is where fi modifying it and finding alternatives. And so, um, just like as an example, <clears throat> our house is beautiful, sadly and beautifully unique in that um, I, myself, and my 15-year-old are both type 1 diabetics. So we are very, very mindful of our food and we pay attention to carbs. I also have celiac disease, which means that I can't have things that have gluten in them, okay? So we don't eat a whole lot of carbs in our house, not only for those reasons, but we just are really conscious of how this affects us and aware of the behaviors that result if we eat certain foods within our, in our um, house. And so if people come over to our house, family, I always make a phone call and I ask them, do you like, do you want bread? You will not find bread in my house. There's no bread. There's no pasta. None. There's not any rice even, and I can technically eat rice. We just don't have rice there. Um, we have the little individual, like, things for cereal that the kids can eat in the morning for, like, breakfast if they want to, but that's it. If you want anything to drink besides water or milk, you need to tell me because we don't drink juice. We have little orange juice packets if our blood sugar gets low, but those are our emergency orange juices, okay? But that's it. So we don't have those types of things. And so instead, what we'll do is we'll slice up vegetables and we'll eat them maybe with dip. We'll get the crunch from those. We'll sprinkle like some of these different like salts or peppers or something that you can kind of get on those and have that instead. We'll maybe um, munch on some nuts, some cheeses, whatever else and have that as part of our meals um, have that as part of our snacks we'll play board games instead of sitting and eating we'll go for a walk after we eat just to kind of help our body start to digest and get some fresh air with things different way of kind of thinking and doing but if you do those types of things it becomes habit becomes easy and you don't think about it anymore the meals that we prepare are vegetable kind of laden with proteins and so we don't get hungry as often just because of the types of food that we're preparing. We don't have those types of cravings and things. And so really, if you notice that you're in these traps, sit down and talk with a dietitian. I'm the biggest fan probably of dietitians. Um, I think that as a healthcare industry, if we all were able to like have like a sit down meeting that our insurance paid for with a dietitian, we'd all be very healthy. Um, if we follow through with what they said, but talk with them about it. Get a better idea of what you and your family may need to eat. <coughs> Perimeter shopping. Don't go down the aisles of the grocery store. <laughs> Those, that's the traps, okay? You're gonna, get, you're gonna get in a trap if that's gonna happen. So shop around the outside. That's where the freshest vegetables, fruits, meats, dairies, um, all of that is gonna come from. And again, by design, that's the types of foods our body is supposed to be eating, all right? Farmer's markets. I'm a huge fan of farmer's markets. Thank God our area is really starting to utilize that a whole lot more um, and we have a lot of farmers that are their livelihood is starting to come back from that go to them check them out um, we go to one every Saturday and we get some of our meat and some of our vegetables from it um, it's wonderful it's cheaper than the grocery store um, and it's healthier it's coming from farms here locally um, and that's again a nice thing to kind of support we have a farmers market here every Wednesday so tomorrow if you're not doing anything between like 9 and 11 30 Come here, <laughs> check it out, it'll be in this room. Um, great opportunity to get some of this stuff. Think about alternatives, all right, for your foods. And so what we're talking about there is um, what we do is moderate. <clears throat> and so instead of having potatoes, you won't find potatoes in our house either. <laughs> um, we use cauliflower. So we make mashed cauliflower. I, anything you can use a potato for, you can basically use a cauliflower for. It's gonna save you money. One cauliflower will get you more than a sack of potatoes ever thought about, all right? And it's not as much, you know, you have to deal with in terms of peeling and everything else. So we will use that cauliflower for mashed cauliflower. We'll use it for um, cauliflower soup. 
which is almost the same recipe as potato soup. I'm just treating the cauliflower as the potato. Um, we'll roast it and eat it that way, okay? Perfect alternative to it. Um, we will use zucchini um, or squashes for noodles, all right? So you can get that at the grocery store, both in the fresh or the frozen section. You can actually get the plant itself and put it through a noodler, and then we'll just serve it as what we would normally do with it. So those are some different ways to kind of think outside the box, but that you can bring to the table. I'd also encourage you to go back if you have them and look through your old family recipes. If you look back at what foods your grandparents were eating and started to bring those to the table now, you would become healthier. I almost guarantee it. I don't even need to know what it is. Um, because they were relying on the farm in order to get their food. They weren't relying on it being processed. They weren't relying on it being um, you know, boxed for years and days or whatever. So go back to that. Think about the Brussels sprouts that used to be at the table, how you maybe used to have sauteed mushrooms or different types of like old school foods that aren't typically uh, brought to the table and considering bringing those in as some of the alternatives. Um, really, really helpful with that. Thinking about moderation um, or and size selection. So whenever it comes to eating, this is a saying that I have, um, ladles are for stirring, not for serving. How many of y'all serve food with a ladle? Mm-hmm, okay. That's too much. <laughs> That's a whole lot. And then what we do is we give everybody that ladle size, right? So if it's me, my husband, uh, my 15-year-old or the four-year-old, everybody's getting the same ladle size. Does that make a bit of sense? No, but we feel like we're depriving everybody from not doing that or whatever, right? No. Ladles are for serving, not for, uh, or for stirring, not for serving. So be mindful of what you're actually serving food with having it down in moderation, um, reading labels so that way you know what actual size or portion of food that you want to kind of use with it. Uh, activity substitution, do something instead. So instead of eating, okay, instead of whenever you notice you're walking to that cupboard, sometimes I'll even have people put a sticky note on it saying like, hey, you know, go for a walk, you know, go do this instead, whatever. Do something. Have a list of different activities or an activity bag that you can pull from if you find yourself in that situation where you're hungry, lonely, tired, whenever you're upset about something, that you can go to using that instead of food. Coloring, um, doing some type of craft, um, reorganizing like a tackle box, making lures, um, whatever, it's fine, but you want to try to do some type of activity. Activities can also help to serve as a mental reset button because they're giving us something purposeful to do and something to discharge whatever that stress is on in that moment. Now, if you ask yourself those questions and say, hey, I'm actually hungry, select a snack that's gonna be nutritious and, then, and that's gonna help you to kind of do whatever it is that you need to do. So instead of the candy bar, right, I might go for maybe um, an apple with some cheese. So I'm kind of pairing that carb with some protein, so that way it's going to help it to be more efficient in terms of its body use. But it's going to be better than the candy bar, right? So we want to think about that. Plan ahead. Um, knowns. Know what you're going to be doing, maybe what places you're going to be at, what stressors that you might encounter along the path, good or bad. So if I'm getting ready to go on vacation, that's a good stress, right? but I also need to be aware that that's going to change my eating habits, okay? And then I need to make maybe some mod uh, modifications in terms of what I'm doing with that. I might need to have some healthy alternatives if I'm going to be away all day at a conference or other things like that, so that way I'm not constantly going back to, you know, a certain table of things. Planning ahead is a really great way to help us to manage our stress and make healthier decisions, especially whenever it comes to eating. A lot of folks will see that people do a lot of meal planning and things like that nowadays. That can be helpful. If you're not that person, have a few go-tos that you can have on hand just to help out in those different types of situations. A uh, few other things real quick. Mindfulness practices. This is something that is, um, we talk about this a lot. Somebody's always asking us to do, I think it's you, wanting us to do mindfulness stuff. Um, 
Mindful eating, and this is something that really encourages us to slow down and to be present in the moment. And so if we go back to mashed potatoes, as an example of a food, everybody here has had mashed potatoes to eat, right? If you think about the last time that you had mashed potatoes, and everybody just kind of sit here and bring that thought to your, the forefront of your mind. Um, were the mashed potatoes real or instant? Okay. Um, were they boiled in chicken stock or in water? Okay, some of you might say chicken, right? Did they have milk, cream, sour cream? You could pick out what they used probably. If you sat there and really think about it, what they used to make that recipe. You could taste it, okay? That's a mindful eating exercise. Whenever you can sit and you can taste all the different flavors within something even as simple as mashed potatoes, by simply taking the time to do that, we're actually slowing down. That's something we need to do anyways, okay, in our cultures, just slow down. Um, and allow ourselves to kind of sit there and eat. We don't overeat whenever we eat slowly, okay? Um, it allows us to appreciate food more, okay? Um, it's a really great practice to kind of have. Mindfulness practices just in general are very healthy, effective, 2,000 years of evidence to support them as a way to cope with stress because it makes us just be present in this moment and not the one that's getting ready to happen 10 minutes from now or that happened 10 years ago. The only one that we can manage is the one right here and right now. And my kind of rule for dealing with this stuff, if I can't touch it in my hands, I don't need it to be interfering almost with up here, right? Um, and that's a good way, again, to kind of even pull myself back whenever I would start to get like worried or anxious or just stressed out about something. Relaxation and refocusing. Um, you can be trained on different breathing techniques, on different types of uh, progressive muscle relaxation, ways to kind of refocus. And that's really what we're trying to do um, whenever we're dealing with stress. It's not focused so much on the stressor, but on something else in life that's more manageable that actually help us to cope with the stressor. And then we want to break up with the idea that food is for comfort, it is for fuel and nutrition. It is designed to help us um, to help fuel, that's supposed to be fuel, and nourish our bodies, not comfort it. That's really what it's designed to do. So we can go to our social support system for help with this, but everybody wants to be on the same page, right? <laughs> I mean, we all just talked about where that can turn, okay? Because we eat. We go together for lunches with folks, right? But if everybody is having, you know, certain things for lunch, it's probably not helping this whole situation out. So drinks for lunch sometimes, that's where it can get out of hand too. Um, family and community. And so we really want to kind of go to those different resources and places for things. Questions? Anything?